Hello, I'm the Grub Street Blogger, and October has been a really good month for books. In fact, I've read some of the best stuff I've read all year this month, so let's get started. I began in fine style by something hot off the press. I read The Testament by Margaret Atwood, and that is the sequel to The Handmaid's Tale. And it's very good, though it's completely and utterly different to The Handmaid's Tale. You see, if you're going into the Testaments looking for the same thing, I can see why some people might be disappointed. They should just take it for what it is. The Handmaid's Tale is a a repressive, it's told in the present tense, there's one character and she doesn't know the future, she doesn't even know if she has a future, everything's tight and you you feel trapped. And uh, it actually gave me nightmares when I read it. The Testaments is not that at all. For a start, it has three characters, so you don't feel trapped because when you with one you move on to the other and the other also out of the three characters one was brought up in Gilead and so doesn't notice the oppression around her quite so much until it it really starts hitting on her and most of the time she was a child and she just had a happy childhood or a mostly happy childhood and so it doesn't have that weight of humiliation. Like, I remember one of the things that most struck me about The Handmaid's Tale is how people, especially women, weren't expected to read. And so the shops just had pictures on it and it was this sort of infantilization. But for this character, that's normal. That's what life is. And actually later when she learns to read, she's being ushered into secret knowledge. It's not that reading is something that everyone should be expected to have or, or should be entitled to. And so it it doesn't have that crushing effect. Another character is actually not from Gilead, or not in Gilead for most of it. And so we see Gilead from the outside, but it it weakens the the oppression because now we see that there is an outside. Um, And we get to spend a bit of time out of Gilead. So it gives us a bit of breathing space. And then the third character is an aunt and very high up the power structure. And although she can't just outright do what she wants, uh, she has to be very, very careful in what she's doing, she gets a lot more freedom than other characters. I think being a handmaid must be the worst position to be in in that society. And so the book is a thrilling adventure story and and sort of a uh, spy story at some points. And though it does have some of those um, unpleasant, gnarly moments, like The Handmaid's Tale, the overall impression of the book is uh, there's much more space and it, it feels more positive, not outright positive, but it, it just it doesn't have that, that squishing, claustrophobic quality that The Handmaid's Tale has. I don't think it's going to have the same cultural capital as The Handmaid's Tale. Uh, I don't think it's going to linger in public consciousness quite the same way. But in and of itself, it's a very enjoyable book. I recommend you read it. The next book was called Fanny Hill in Bombay. And it's a literary biography of John Cleland, the man who wrote Fanny Hill, which I did a previous video of on this channel. And it claims it's not a literary biography. It doesn't really want to be one because it's saying in the age of death of the author, what use is a literary biography? Um, but then it just outright is one, so I, I don't know what all the hammering was about at the beginning. John Cleland then, interesting man. Uh, I didn't know, for example, that until his mid-30s, he'd been working in India, in Bombay, as a member of the East Indian Company. Uh, I didn't know that Fanny Hill was written as a sort of parlour game between him and a friend. Uh, and he had the, a rough draft with him for years and years, never intending to publish it. But when he came back to London and things went wrong and he was in prison for debt, he turned to it to make some money. Uh, it also went through later things that John Cleland wrote. He he went on this weird um, linguistic strain where he claimed to have decoded the original Celtic languages and that everything good about Britain comes from the Celts. And the Celts have this um, society that's neither patriarchal nor matriarchal. It's a, it's it's run by druids, and druids are law givers, and 
it's run by the law and male and female can be upholders of the law and he it's very odd uh these fantasies that he went on uh in his later life there was also a lot of discussion about his own sexuality there are some people who have said that he was probably gay um partly because he was accused of it he was accused of of sodomy as as the rule was um and some of his friendships definitely uh, were involved in that but we're talking of a time when there isn't really a gay identity it's only developing in molly houses and things so even if he was he wasn't yeah he seems to be most interested in uh liminal spaces and things that aren't quite one thing things that aren't quite another for example i never really thought with fanny hill oh yeah he's writing as a prostitute but we're reading as a madam because the, the the book is written to dear madam and it, is that just madam as in a woman or is it a madam uh who are we pretending to be when we read the book it was it opened a lot of interesting questions about that book and about um his life and about the the, the odd sort of slightly shunted to the side positions in society in the 18th century and it was very enjoyable i really don't know why it quibbled so much about being literary biography in the first place the next book was called samuel johnson in context uh, and in the context of me uh, reading this book, it was because I started my uh, volunteering at the Dr. Johnson house, and it's one of the books on the shelves. And I started reading it, and I liked it, so I bought it, and I read it all. It's 47 essays. Doesn't sound great. It was actually absolutely wonderful. Each essay is about Samuel Johnson's relationship with some aspect of the 18th century or some aspect of his life. So the earlier ones were him in relation to his life, him in relation to his reputation at, during his life, uh, and then his reputation until 1900, and then his reputation after. But then when we get into the meat of it, it was um, all about finance and currency and how his writing matches with that all about um women educated women um all about colonialism or anthropology or science or and it actually all came together that's the surprising thing when i just read straight through it i'm not totally sure if that's how you're supposed to read it but i did and each one just chips out a little piece a uh, facet of samuel johnson and so you get to the end and you get a, a quite a wonderful rounded portrait of him. I would certainly recommend that book, Samuel Johnson in Context, which was edited by Jack Lynch. Uh, after you've read um, Rasselas, Ramblers, his poetry, uh, <laughs> Boswell's life, <laughs> maybe John Wayne's life, definitely Walter Jackson Bates' life, then get to Johnson in Context. It was really, really good and one of the best things I've read this year. The next book I read was Dragons and Unicorns and Natural History. I like books about dragons. I like books about unicorns. Um, the Flight of Dragons is one of my favourite books. It purports to be a scientific excuse. Apologia? Is that word? Apology? Uh, claiming that dragons were definitely real. Here's how they worked. Here's why we can't find any evidence of them anymore. And it ties in stories about dragons into a sort of consistent whole to make a, a life cycle of the dragon and a biology of the dragon. And it's a wonderful, wonderful book. And then I've read a couple of unicorn books all about how the myth of the unicorn grew, uh, how it took from different sources, how it took from real animals, how it took from uh, ideas about nature and about Christianity and how they were applied to the idea of the unicorn. And so they're wonderful as well. And I was hoping that this book would be a sort of bit of the two, and it just wasn't. Uh, the dragons were really pathetic. In Flight of Dragons, they have this sort of acidic um, gas, well, no, it's acid that produces a gas in their body. It produces hydrogen, and that's how they fly. You know, they've got little stubby wings. They fly like blimps. And they, they breathe fire because they need to get rid of the gas and it ignites as it comes out. In this, uh, all dragons are vegetarian and 
the reason they breathe fire is because they're full of methane. They're like super cows. It's a bit rubbish. And the unicorn stuff was nothing I haven't heard. Uh, and nothing that hadn't been delivered better somewhere else. So this was quite a big disappointment for me, really. Oh well. The next book I read was Lady Audley's Secret, in which Lady Audley has a secret. In fact, by about midway, it's confirmed what the secret is. And it's not that far into it when you've got an idea what the secret might be, because this is not a whodunit, and it's not a mystery story as such. It's a sensation novel. It kind of has more, um, more in common with the gothic novels of earlier. You, you read it and, and you get the sensations from it. It's not, oh, what's the mystery? It's, oh, wow, this happened. And it's really, really lushly narrated. Um, very long sentences. Uh, some really peculiar similes. Uh, there was a cactus that was described as demented. It's just a little scene. you know. Um, we've gone into this building. There were some cactuses there. God, they look demented. Demented cactuses. Somebody has uh, fresh, ripe lips, which is very good. Uh, the main character is Robert Audley. He is a lazy, not particularly dynamic, relaxed man who lives by himself. I could, I could see, I could relate. And he, um, he starts to question his aunt or his, his step aunt, wondering. If she all that she says she is. At the same time, he met up with his friend called George, and George went missing. And so he tries to find out why George is missing and if this has any connection to Lady Audley and her secret slash secrets. And then he marries George's sister Clara, and the way he keeps describing Clara is the way he described George. So I think he was in love with George, and that's what motivates the whole story, and that. He sort of takes Clara as second best. So you, you could do quite an interesting queer reading of this book as well. Uh, and this kind of fear of femininity as represented by Lady Audley. And yes, it's a little bit longer than it needs to be. Um, for someone looking for a compelling mystery, it might be a bit lacking. But if you read it for what it is, it was a really good book. I very much enjoyed it. The next thing I read was The Haunting of Hill House. And it has some odd connections with Lady Audley's secret in that you could definitely do a quite clear uh, queer reading of this book. And at the beginning and the end, it sets out very clearly there are ghosts. There is Hill House. It is insane. It has ghosts. My interpretation says there are no ghosts in it at all. We follow Eleanor and she is a dreamer. And a daydreamer, but she's a very infantile daydreamer. She dreams of princesses and castles and fairy tales as, as she's going to Hill House. And then she gets there and we get everything reported through her. And so the characters have really strange conversations where they, they, they're talking not just across purposes. They, they seem to be talking around subjects all the time. And I'm not sure how much of that is what the characters are saying. And how much of that is how Eleanor's interpreting it. And as ghostly things happen, and there's a very famous scene with some knocking on the door, which actually was really quite creepy. It was it was very well done. But I'm not sure there are ghosts. I think we spend so long in Eleanor's head and Eleanor is not quite there. Um, at one point I thought Eleanor and one of the other characters called Theo were being recast as the, these two daughters who lived in the house years before because it keeps describing them as childish and childlike and they do things like you know, tug each other's pigtails and run off and very childish things but it didn't quite go there but something was going on it's off kilter the house is described as being off kilter the, the floors are all wonky the doors don't match up um the outside of the house doesn't properly match the inside that the rooms are arranged in spirals rather than ordinary room plans 
And I think the book is very much the same. The book is off kilter all throughout, and that's what brings the dread, and that's what makes it uh, thrilling. And it really is. It was. It was really good. <laughs> Uh, the next book I read in October was called The Lady Ichikubo, or Ichikobo? Ichikubo is what I went with. Uh, it's also called Ichikubo Monotagari. It's a 10th century Japanese story, and if the translation's right, it's essentially a novel. It's, it's, it's a novel from the 10th century, which is astonishing. When you think we were writing Beowulf at the time as, you know, big buff dudes beating up monsters... And this is a complex society with very, very careful gradations of scale and, and uh, superiority. Uh, the difference between the cultures is amazing. There's, there's so much more like our culture now. And I was expecting to be quite lost by this book because I know very little of Japanese culture. Even things like anime and that just weren't around much near me when I was a kid. I've never really got into any of that. And I know nothing about 10th century Heian, 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 Japanese culture. Nothing. And yet I felt really at home because it was very much like an early modern novel from Europe. It, you know, late 17th, early 18th century, there were bits that were definitely Eliza Hayward. Uh, well, they weren't because she was many centuries after, but it reminded me of Eliza Hayward. And bits that reminded me of Afra Ben. And there was even some Fielding-esque bits that w wouldn't have gone out of place in Fielding or, or Smollett. And so it wasn't as confusing or alienating as it could have been. It felt really quite comfy. And I think it's amazing how the novel sort of comes out of these cultures. And the cultures sort of seem similar. They, they're aspirational. They're quite um, capitalistic. And there's a lot of hierarchies that that are that are dealt with there, and I really did enjoy it. Uh, it's it's about Lady Ichikubo, who is uh, her stepmother is is very unpleasant to her, makes her do all the work. It's not Cinderella, but midway through she finds a prince, and then the question is, well, what happens then? And that's what that's what gets interesting, really, for me. Uh, one of the ways that I did get a bit lost or had to be on the alert is that very few of the characters are given names. Lady Ichikubo, Ochikubo, that's not her name, that's a, a title. It means uh, Lady of the Below Stairs, and the Below Stairs are where servants are, so it's, it's, it's a term of abuse. But as she moves through society, her name changes because her position changes, and this happens to everybody in the book. So everyone's name is always changing depending on what position they're in. Uh, and you have to be a bit careful to keep an eye on that. The other thing is marriage. Uh, this uh, 10th century Japanese society seems to have a very different idea of what marriage is and how marriage works. It seems to be you go for three nights and you sleep together with your intended, and by the third night you make your decision about whether you're going to be married or not. And it seems that you can have more than one wife, and it's quite easy to uh, pull out of a marriage it's it's a very different institution and so some of the stakes were a bit confusing for me because i'm used to the you know the european model uh, but yeah it was surprisingly interesting and and very good and i'm definitely gonna look up the tale of genji one day which is supposed to be a much better book the last book i read this month was the driver's seat by muriel spark and in a previous video, I wasn't very keen on The Bachelors, really. But I love this. This is possibly the best thing I've read this year. Definitely up there. Definitely in top five. It's very, very short. I haven't got a copy of me because I lent it to someone straight away. And it's about a woman going on holiday. Except she isn't. And it's... I can't... I can't talk about it because the, the twist... At the end, or not the twist, but the end result then makes everything else justified. So you're reading it and you're thinking, well, why is she doing this? Uh, the very first thing that happens is she is buying a dress and she's absolutely mortified that the dress is stain proof. She thinks this is a terrible thing. And you think, well, why does she think that's terrible? And then she goes on holiday, she keeps pretending to be different people. And she's looking for a, a boyfriend or, or a man. 
who she says she'll know when she sees him. So sometimes she talks about him as if she's expecting him to be there. But other times it's, it's obvious that he might not be there, that he might not even exist. Um, and she divests like her passport, she just leaves in a taxi, her this, her that, the, as she goes on. And it does all build up to something. And it's, it's short, but it is punchy. It was so good. And it's written in the present tense. And I really like a good present tense bit of writing. Uh, my novel, uh, The Death of the Dream Peddler, is written in present tense, um, whether that's good or not. But I do like it. And this is really, really tight. And in the first three paragraphs, it's present tense. And then it takes us on a flashback for the events two seconds before the bit in the present tense and then catches us back up into the present tense again. And it's such an unsettling way to begin it. And then there are little flashes to the future and you know things aren't going to end well. But you don't know why and you don't know how and you don't know who's in the driver's seat. And so that was the last uh, of the books I read this month. So yeah, I, I loved loads of the things I read this one. Lady Ochikubo was really good. Samuel Johnson in Context. Uh, the Fanny Burney book. Wanting a Hill House. Lady Audley. Um, you know, Driver's Seat. There were so many good books this month uh, that I really, really enjoyed. And I hope next month will be just as enjoyable. Thank you very much. It's all part of my awesome almanac.